Hello, everyone. Oh my goodness, it's been a while. Welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Uh, this is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. I am your host, Leanne Lord. It's good to be back. I am a stand-up comedian, author, Center for Inquiry fellow, and fellow Earth dweller. Uh, it is fortuitous that today is National Ask an Atheist Day. But honestly, we should all be asking way more questions every day. Uh, lately, my top questions seem to be, uh, what? Seriously? And uh, OK, who, who, who's in charge here? Who's in charge? Uh, usually the answer is no one. Uh, but before I go too far field, thank you so much for joining us. All of you who are with us in real time right now, and uh, those of you who are watching on the recording, while I have you, please be sure to check out the latest episode of Point of Inquiry, uh, available wherever you get your podcast. And if you haven't already, please round out your reading list with Skeptical Inquirer magazine. You can subscribe very easily to it at skepticalinquirer.org. Also, and this is very exciting, registration is open for SciCon 2024 in Las Vegas, October 24th through 27th. Um, I'll be there and I hope that you are too. Now, tonight's presentation, is the planet full? What we need to know about overpopulation. See, in 2022, the human population reached 8 billion people, right? I thought it was a little crowded in here. Um, and later this century, it might actually reach 10 billion. Uh, apparently, we are a busy wolf species. Or to quote the group Genesis, uh, there's too many men, too many people making too many problems. Land of confusion, indeed. Now, our guest tonight has spent decades studying and writing about systems biology and the natural world. Uh, he's an associate professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University, and his article, Myths About Overpopulation, is featured in this latest issue of Free Inquiry, page 36, everyone. And so tonight, he will address the most challenging question humanity has ever faced. Are we too many? And is nature losing out? So please welcome to the Skeptical Inquirer Presents screen, Peter Utes. All right, thank you, uh, Leanne and everybody for showing up today and for uh, having an interest in, in this topic. I have to admit, I'm not a demography expert, okay? I'm a biologist and so that's my perspective. But, you know, depending on what your perspective is, you may have totally different opinions about the subject. So. Um, let me start by um, sharing my screen so I can show you a couple of slides on that topic. And let me start with a couple of books on the subject. So, I mean, obviously there have been dozens of books published on the human population, overpopulation or whatever, but all of these books have slightly different tags and actually different opinions. In fact, I mean, these are some of the books I've read over the past few years. And what I've realized is that people come to totally different conclusions when they look at the problem. So for example, the first three of these books shown here, they totally say we have too many people, okay? And then the next couple of books, they actually show, say, well, we may have too many people, but you know, it's, uh, we, we can do something about it. So they are kind of optimistic. And then there's books which say, well, we don't have too many people. It's actually not a problem. We can have many more people, so uh, no deal. Um, and then there's these books that, well, we actually, uh, we run into the problem of having too few people. So we need to get started making more babies uh, actually pretty soon. Um, so the question is now, what is correct? And uh, what can we say about that? The, the issue uh, at hand here is that, of course, different people come from different directions. As I said, you know, I'm, I'm a biologist. I come from that direction. There are uh, like some other biologists in that list, for example, Paul Ehrlich is a biologist, and this guy, uh, uh, Später, is a biologist. This guy is actually a demographer, Virgil Skirbeck, and these other guys may be economists or sociologists or journalists or something else. So let me just like review a couple of these books and their main theses so you get a sense of what these guys are all talking about. 
So this book, for example, the original population one from Paul Ehrlich, he literally uh, said that um, we, uh, we, we have a problem. There's too many people, okay? And government needs to do something about it. Um, and we may actually run into food production problems. There's not enough people, uh, not enough food for these people, and they will starve soon by the billions. And of course, we have biodiversity loss and other things. Now, oh, there was, of course, pretty quickly people who opposed that opinion said, like uh, Julian Simon, an economist, who said, well, no, actually, that's not true. We have plenty of food. And he actually, he was proven right. It, it's actually true. The agricultural industry managed to produce plenty of food for most people, even if we can argue about like distribution issues, that's another issue. But in total, there's enough food for everybody. Julian Simon also said global warming is actually not really a problem. It's a transient problem. It will go away. So he was not right in everything he said. Um, this book, in this, I mean, in, in, in quite the opposite direction, said our overpopulation is a total myth and it's actually racist and it's just blaming poor people for being too many. Um, they also say population problems are caused by big corporations who just produce a lot of stuff which uh, cause a lot of environmental damage every year. Okay, well, that's uh, not that's not wrong. That's totally true too. Um, and it also they also said that um, it's not people who have to change; it's big business which has to change. So, in other words, like politics and business practices have to change. Um, and then finally, they even claim that individual consumption is not a cause of environmental destruction. So they blame basically most of it uh, onto big corporations. So that's kind of the left, uh, you know, political view. There's other books which go in a similar direction, but with a different argumentation. So they say the world is not overpopulated um, and it's unlikely to be so anytime soon. In fact, they say, you know, we will be threatened by depopulation pretty soon. And they, I mean, the, the, the direction they are coming is a bit weird because they also uh, cite a lot of like Christian fundamentalist people like uh, Jacqueline Kassoon, who apparently said as a devout Christian and pro-lifer, that this whole anti-baby propaganda is just nonsense and it's uh, organized by people like Planned Parenthood. Um, Actually, they say literally that the sustainable human population Earth can be up to 70 billion people. So we, you know, we are far from being overpopulated. And then finally, we have uh, like this book here, which uh, of course says we are too few, at least soon. So we need more people who work, pay taxes, do all the innovation and do all that stuff we need to do in a, in a functional society. Um, I have to say, there's, of course, the famous people like uh, Elon Musk, who also goes into the same direction. He says, the world population is literally accelerating towards collapse. And if these trends continue, humanity will cease to exist. Well, I mean, we have to listen to Elon Musk because he has like, yeah, what is it, 140 million followers on Twitter. So a lot of people listen to him. Um, unfortunately, he also says a lot of things which are literally nonsensical like there are too many cars there are not too many cars but there are too few roads and um, in fact we should probably build double decker roads uh, to uh, main, uh, keep all of these cars running so you see where that's coming from all right let's look at the actual population projection um, in this case from the united nations which is the uh, uh, most reliable, I would say, or at least it has been pretty reliable in the past. So right now we are about 8 billion or 8.2 billion, about something like this. Um, in fact, you can see that in the 1950s, there were only like two and a half billion people. In fact, like in 1990, the UN predicted that we will reach 8 billion around 2020. So they were a little bit off. Like their 30 year projection was off by one or two years, okay? So it, they were not totally exact, but they were all pretty good, I would say. Um, so right now, their projection says that we will reach a peak of maybe 10 billion people or slightly more in around to 2060 to 2080. And then, you know, it may go down again, okay? All right, okay, so that's the current projection. 
that's the a billion I just mentioned, 2024 roughly. So that's where we are today. And so everything on the right hand side is projected. The left hand side is all real data. All right. So why do we go down? Why is the uh, population decline projected? Because fertility rates across most countries, or actually pretty much all countries, have gone down quite substantially, if not dramatically. You can see this like from 1950, where many countries had like four, five, six, seven kids. Most countries are now at two or three kids, let's say on average. As I said, the average is 2.3 right now. Um, there are still some countries like in North Africa or, or Central Africa in the Sahel, which have still six or seven kids, but it's rather the exception. There's one line down here at the bottom at one child. It's not China, as you can, if you can read that. It's actually the Vatican. And I don't even know why the Vatican is here because I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if they are supposed to have kids at all because it's all men, isn't it? But well, that's what um, our world in data says. All right, okay. So now here's the important thing. Here is a projection of the human population over 3000 years. So let's step back and take a big picture view here. So over thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, there were only a few million people on the planet. Now, like let's say eight, about 1800, we had about 1 billion. And since then, we just literally exploded. So we are now at 8 billion. And uh, if you uh, remember the protection from the UN I just showed you, we probably reach 9 or 10 billion in a couple of decades. And after that, we probably almost certainly will significantly uh, go down quite substantially. And that's based on these fertility rates, which are all going down all over the world. All right, okay, so that's the current big picture view. Now, the problem is, right now, of course, we can argue, well, we can, all, we can feed all the people and stuff. And so we may have environmental consequences like climate change, but if we literally reach a plateau and go down, we may actually have, quite different problems, namely social and economic consequences. Like economists usually predict that the economy worldwide will simply collapse or tank or, you know, it's just like everybody will have a huge problem. Um, well, we can, we can talk about that in a few minutes or afterwards. Uh, that's just the current view. In fact, this is from an article which was written by an economist and he was pretty uh, pessimistic about the future as an economist. All right, so let's take, an, let's take a look at one of these examples of countries which have really low birth rates, such as South Korea, which is probably the country which has the lowest birth rate right now at uh, 0.8 kids per woman. Um, South Korea has 51 million people right now. And so the question is now, when would we expect South Korea to go extinct if they keep having so few kids? Um, so you can guess for yourself how long it would take. Is it like 100 years or 200 years or 300 years, whatever? So we should have made the poll for that question too. But I'll just let you think about this for one second. And then I give you the answer based on these projections we have seen in the slide or uh, two slides ago. The projection is South Koreans will go extinct around 2750. So it will be like 700 years from now. Okay, so... It's not exactly a totally urgent problem, but it's a problem that you may keep in mind because Korea, South Korea has really a pretty low birth rate. But um, I also want to point out here that South Korea has a population density of more than 500 people per square kilometer. How does that compare to like the US or Germany? It's 236 in Germany and 34 in the US, which is like, 20 times less than South Korea, okay? So that's another reason why hmm, maybe it's not such a bad thing that South Koreans don't have as many kids as they used to have. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about nature and biodiversity and what our impact as a human population is on, um, on nature. In particular, I would like to talk about land and humanity uses it. Um, not everything is as pretty as Bryce Canyon as you see in this picture here, um, but there's a lot of different landscapes in the, uh, let me focus for a minute on the US because it's actually a good example. It's not overpopulated as most people would agree probably, 
Um, but land is still used, you know, uh, pretty heavily all over the place. And now the question is, how is land actually used in the US for these um, 340 million people or so who are here in the country? That's a, a summary of land use based on, I think it's from the USDA originally, but it was published by Bloomberg. It's a map of all the um, different areas which are used in different in ways. And you can see here like all the yellow spots are pasture rangeland for mostly cattle farming. You see all the green dots, which are uh, forests. You see cropland, uh, a bunch of other things. Special use include things such as military use, miscellaneous urban, of course. There's a lot of cities and populated places and so on. So how if we rearrange all of these dots into a better organized map, it would look like this. And you can see it just in the US, which has a pretty low population density, a huge area is just used for raising cows and producing beef and milk and that kind of stuff. And actually a lot of that area is used for livestock feed. In total, this makes up more than 40% of the land area in the US. And you can see all these other areas here, okay, like timberland, which is also, of course, used for wood production. You can, all the other farming, you know, we have uh, a bunch of uh, urban areas and, and things like this. And all this. So, so, like, the US is pretty well used. It's not like there's a lot of totally pristine land in the country. Um, and again, this is a reminder that the population density is only 33 uh, people per square kilometer compared to like Africa. So like there's more people per square kilometer in Africa than in the US. Um, and that includes like big chunks like the Sahara, which has literally no people. Okay, Like India has 424 and even China has like um, five times more than the US. All right. Um, so if we now look at where are actually the people in Wales actually wilderness and Wales like real nature? So this is a map of all the wildernesses on earth. And by wilderness, these guys define wilderness as areas which you cannot just like reach by car within, you know, like uh, half an hour or so. So you have to really go through a jungle or something. There's no roads and stuff, okay? Within like 10 miles. I forget what the, the cutoff was, but it's like 10 miles or so. And you can see there's literally hardly any wilderness left in the world. There's only like four big chunks here, which is the Amazon, the Sahara, which is, well, the desert, the, uh, all the, um, the, 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 the interior of Australia is all desert, basically. And then we have the Tibetan Plateau, which is mostly mountains. So it's also difficult to inhabit and to grow anything. And then you have all these Arctic Circle areas in Canada and Russia, which are also just forests. Okay, so the only literal wilderness we have on Earth is, is the Amazon. And as you probably know, the Amazon is threatened, okay? And you can see this in the next slide. Okay, so this is actually what's going on in the Amazon, in Brazil in particular. So all the red areas are areas which are currently under deforestation. So people are just like keep chopping down the, uh, the jungle. Um, in fact, this is actually not a measure of the jungle, it's actually a measure of emission. So in those areas where you cut down trees, you release carbon, while in the other areas where you do not cut down forest, you actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. So by just measuring that, you can actually measure how much, um, how many trees are uh, cut and how many areas are under deforestation. And as it, actually, right now, the, the total is there's more carbon released from the Amazon than there is um, storage. So, and that's, I would say, a pretty scary prospect. All right, uh, let's look at some specific areas of biodiversity. This was kind of a big picture thing about like um, wildernesses and deforestation. So let's look at a, at a few examples. So here is, here is American bison and the places where American bison roamed like before, uh, Europeans arrived in the New World. So bison was literally everywhere in North America. I mean, from all the way up in Canada to all the way down to, to Mexico, okay? But within a hundred years or so, the ranges of bison literally shrank to like a few small pockets of um, national parks or other areas where they still have natural populations. And I think that's also pretty scary. 
So, but this is just one species, okay? And um, you can argue, well, maybe we just uh, replace the bison by cattle, okay? So it's not a big deal. It's basically the same thing. Uh, I would disagree, but uh, you know, let's look at a few other things here before we discuss that. So um, I have to. I would mention at that point that so one of the things I'm doing, um, I'm I'm one of the people who work on the catalog of life, which is a big catalog, an online catalog of all life forms on the planet. So I'm contributing twelve thousand species of reptiles, you know, among other things, and um, that's just a small fraction of the two million species they have in this database. So if you want to have a database of all species in the world, that's where you can um, find that list. There may be 10 or 20 or 30 million species on the planet. We don't even know that, you know, because these things are not formally described, you know. So um, I'm just saying that's what we know about right now. So that's one of the bases for studies of um, species loss and uh, extinction rates and that kind of stuff. And people use this database, but they also use another database, which is maintained by the International, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. They, these are the guys who make the red lists. And they do regular inventories and assessments of the species they have in their database. Right now, or recently, they had 42,000 species um, assessed as threatened by extinction. And according to their analysis, that's roughly 28% of all assessed species. And of course, that's very different across the board. You know, so amphibians are more threatened than, for example, birds, because I mean, birds can fly away. Okay? So they can usually escape from like... Uh, um, deforestation and things like this. But any of other things, there's certain groups, groups of plants which are equally in bad shape. But overall, you say it's pretty, you know, it's, it's a pretty large number of species which are threatened. Um, so that, that, these are just a bunch of numbers. So we can go into a little bit more detail. Like if you look at vertebrates, we can look at the populations of vertebrates on Earth. And that's based on 3,700 species, which were looked at. It's it's a related database by maintained by the Living Planet um, people, but you can see also overall the number of um, vertebrates is pretty regularly going down for like decades now. Okay, so that's also kind of scary. Here is another uh, study uh, published by a colleague of mine, Daniel Pinchero de Noso, who who looked at 70,000 species. Um, also based on IUCN data, and they realized that 40 and roughly 50% of all species had decreasing population sizes, which means, as in the bison case, their populations were just shrinking, okay, like getting smaller and smaller, even if the species were not extinct or close to extinction, but the populations went downhill. The other half was roughly stable, which is the good news. And there's even a few uh, species, you know, 3% of the species of these 70,000, which have increasing populations. I'm not sure if that's really good news because uh, quite a few of those, and I don't have a number, but quite a few of those are probably invasive species. So it's actually not a good news that they are increasing uh, in population size. All right, so um, let's get back to the bison. And um, so shrinking populations could be argued are not a problem because as long as you have some areas where the species is common, that's all good and fine. But the problem is that it's not just like the population size, which is go down, which goes down, but it's actually genetic diversity. If you think about, you have 10 million bison here, and then maybe at the end you have only 5,000. You, lo you lost a lot of genetic diversity, which that species may need to adapt to like a changing climate, for example. And if you have a shrinking population and you have climate change, hmm, maybe that's actually a death knell for that particular species. All right, um, one other measure you can look at um, our impact and natural populations is to look at the um, diversity of all mammals. In this case, there, there was a, actually a few studies which looked at the um, at, at all the mammals in the world, there are about 6,000 species, and they try to estimate the weight of all of these wild mammals, okay? Like if you take all of these animals, like going from mice to elephants to whales to whatever that is, here, squirrels and all that stuff, and you put them on in a balance and you weigh them, and then you, at the same time, you measure the weight of all the humans and their livestock what would that fraction be? And we actually have a little quiz. If Leanne can pop out the quiz, all of the people who are listening right now, you can actually, um, you should be able to um, see that quiz. There we go. 
So if you just click the percentage of humans and uh, their livestock as a percentage of all mammals on the planet, how much would you think that is? In other words, again, you know, how many, how, how much of the weight of all mammals is represented by humans and their livestock? So just click the percentage you believe represents humans and their livestock and maybe leave this up for 10 seconds. I hope the question was clear enough. Um, so it's gone out a few seconds. And then maybe Leanne can show us the result, what the poll says. Oh, we have a quite a range. That's amazing. Okay, so people cannot really agree on um, what the fraction is. Is it 10%? or 20, 30, 40, 50, 60%, percent. we go down. Um, wow, I'm actually quite surprised, actually. It's such a range. All right, the answer is it's 96% of all the mammals on the planet are actually humans or their livestock by weight. And that shows us how dominant we and our agriculture is actually compared to all the other life forms on the planet. I think it's I think it's mind boggling to be honest. Okay. And I think when I saw that, I just even couldn't believe it. Um, but that's that's the fact. Okay. Okay. So let's look at some of the impacts actually have besides uh all that agriculture and farming. So uh I don't want to talk about climate change too much, but since everybody else is talking about climate change, but we have to bring it up because it is it is an easy measure, you know, because we can measure CO2 emissions and all that stuff. And uh mostly and Right, rightfully, people say, well, I mean, most of the CO2 is actually caused by a bunch of rich people in the, you know, in the global north. You know, you can see that like top, the top 10% or even the top 1% of people in on the planet produce like 100 tons of CO2 each per year. And even the top 10% still produce like 28 tons. Okay, compared to everybody else, it's you can almost neglect everybody else uh, based on that. Well, actually, is that really true? Actually, it's not quite true because that's just one way of looking at it. Because if you look not just like at the per capita emissions, but uh, the total emissions, what you see is something like this. The top 10% still produce half of all emissions. Yeah, absolutely right. So the rich guys are the bad guys. But at the same time, the middle 40%, like the middle class, is almost producing as much CO2 as the rich 10%. And admittedly, yeah, absolutely, the like the, the, the poorest people on the planet, they have almost no uh, CO2 emissions, okay? So we can, in that sense, we can ignore them almost. However, you know, the problem is that the middle class is rapidly growing. So here is a curve of the fraction of people belonging to the middle class. Just like 30 years ago or 40 years ago, it was only 10%. Right now, it's 40%. And in 10 years, it will be 60%. Right now, the world adds about 80 million people every year. And these 80 million people go right into the middle class. They're not born necessarily in the middle class. But while the 80 million people are born, at the same time, 80 million people move into the middle class. So it's the rapidly, maybe the most rapidly growing group of people on the planet. So their impact will grow and grow accordingly. And so we'll take over like the rich guys pretty soon. And of course, like the middle, middle class people want to become rich in the end, you know, so that's the whole goal to become rich and produce more CO2, I guess. Okay, let's uh, look at uh, two examples um, of uh, emerging economies, India and China, because there are such large um, populations. Um, I highlighted the year 1980 or 1979 here because that was the year when China introduced the one-child policy. At that time, they had less than a billion people. India had less than 700 million people. Right now, uh, so okay, that's the end. Uh, 2016 was the end of the one-child policy. Right now, we have 1.4 billion in both countries. So they reached this kind of peak at, at this point. So... What I wanted to show you here is that China needed 40 years to go from the one-child policy to a stable population peak. India just reached a replacement level number of children, 2.1 children on average per woman 
like last year, which means China, uh, India will require also 40 years to reach that peak probably. That means their population will keep going for decades before it stops, but that's not really the problem. The problem is not necessarily the number of people, but of course the amount of consumption these people produce. Here we have the number of cars in China. So you can see that in 1980, which was about the time when the one child policy uh, went into effect, there was almost no cars in, in, uh, in China. Now we have 200, whatever, 80 million cars, which is uh, 223 cars per thousand people. And now you can see that's compared to the US or the uh, EU, which has more than 500 cars per thousand people. In other words, the number of cars in China will, will just keep growing for decades probably. And the same will happen in India, just with some delay of maybe 10 years, but their economy is growing by six or 7% a year. So they will have you know, an equal uh, exponential growth in cars and consumption. I don't blame these people. I don't blame anybody, okay? So these guys, of course, deserve all their consumption, but it also means the more consumption we have, the less people, number of people we can actually afford. And that's what you, you all know, probably the earth overshoot graphics in this slide here, which shows that you know, if everybody lived like the average American, we would need five earths in terms of resource consumption, CO2 emissions, land use and all that stuff. And uh, that's true, of course, for most other industrialized countries. Even China is in overshoot for like a number of years now. And India is actually pretty close. You know, even India, which has, very little resource consumption still. In a couple of years, they will use more resources than they actually could afford, even on a per capita basis, which is, I think, kind of scary. All right, okay, so these are all the effects um, of um, population growth. Now, let's, let's be a little bit more um, optimistic and think about what can we do about all that stuff? Um, and I say, okay, I, I would address Elon Musk because he's a tech guy, so he usually has some cool tech ideas. I'm not sure why he's so scared about or worried about depopulation or population collapse, because I mean, there are solutions, you know, uh, which we can, which we can use. And I mean, one of the first solutions, which a lot of people work on is, of course, life expectancy, longevity. So, I mean, we know that life expectancy, we don't, we haven't solved that problem. Okay. But I would say within a hundred years, it's, we probably have a good chance of uh, increasing life expectancy. And I, I don't want to get rid of old people, obviously, but um, maybe we can get rid of, um, you know, like all the aging problems we have right now. I, I would even guess as a, as a biologist that we probably can reach immortality or something like that, like a life expectancy of hundreds of years within a few hundred years. I'm, I'm pretty, optimistic about that. And optimistic doesn't mean like we should, but uh, we can probably take technologically. So that will be, that will have a big effect on, of course, population development. Also, I mean, I talked about land use and meat production. Why not just like grow like steaks on trees? Um, that's biologically totally possible. Um, it's not possible yet, but it will be maybe within a few decades, okay? I think technically we have some of the tools to do that and we have the principles to do that. It will be a lot of work, but in theory, I say it's totally possible to do that. And I'm not talking about like lab meat or all the impossible burgers, which are made out of pea and beans and all that stuff. I'm talking about real meat of muscle tissue grown on plants, okay? So that would be another kind of solution to that problem. I mean, people work on artificial uteruses, you know, in the future, and I'm not sure when this will happen, but it may happen also within the next hundred years or so. We will have uteruses outside women. I mean, women, of course, are afraid to have babies, you know, but uh, maybe they don't want to have babies. You know, if we, if we really have a problem of having too few babies, maybe that may be a, a solution you know, to which is like outsource baby making to uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm sure there will be a lot of comments on that, but we can talk about that later, okay? So one other thing is innovation, okay? So um, quite a few people, including the Economist, the, the, the Economist magazine claimed that we need more people to have enough innovation. In this graph, you see the number of patents people have uh, 
over the uh, number of babies they have. Um, and that each of these dots shows one country. So this is by country, okay? And one of the things you see here is that, of course, the more kids people have, the fewer patents they have. So as a proxy for innovation. So, I mean, having a lot of babies doesn't mean you're innovative, okay? So you have to, you have, to have the right education system and the right culture and all that stuff as well. Um, so I think that's another solution. In fact, there are some studies like this one, um, which showed that you can actually uh, have low fertility and still be prosperous if you invest in education, if you invest in technology, in, if you invest in uh, productivity growth. Now we have AI and all that stuff. So, hmm, you know, if you think about it, maybe you don't need all that many people. You know, if you think about autonomous cars, for example, they, I mean, if, if all the cars in the world drive by themselves, you just don't need 200 million drivers overall, for example. That, that, that's a big deal. Okay, I mean, that's just like big companies and things what they can do. But what about ourselves? What, what can we do in our daily lives? And um, let, let me say one more thing about uh, the global perspective because we, before we go into our own contributions. So, for example... Of course, there are countries which have still too many babies, mostly in Africa, but there's also a lot of countries which have too few babies. At least they say they have too few babies. So one thing we can do, of course, you know, we can, of course, um, replace too few uh, babies in these rich countries by people from other countries. Like we need a certain number of immigration, of course. We can argue how much immigration, but for example, if China wanted to replace all the people they are losing from a shrinking population they could they could currently i think the estimates are uh, accept up to 8 million immigrants per year okay so i mean i guess i don't say they should maintain their population i think they should probably go down but so if they had only 4 million immigrants they still would go down and still could replace a lot of these jobs and of course like uh, the rich world has to support all the poor countries with technology and industrialization so they can actually keep up and develop and not become as dependent on the kids and farming as um, like we were like 100 years ago or so. I have to say one sentence about or a few sentences about culture and religion because it is also an important factor in that whole discussion. Um, and it's a good thing that the, uh, the the current pope actually released an encyclica a couple of years ago, which um, which said well, we should protect the earth and we, sh we should be sustainable on, on all, all that stuff. But he also said that, and he said this on record, okay, he said that every woman should have about three children, even if they, even if the Catholics should not breed like rabbits. So if every woman in the world would have three children, remember that curve, we would be somewhere up here. In fact, if we added half a child, that's what this blue curve says, okay? With half a child more per woman, we would be at 60 billion, 16 billion people at the end of the century. At the same time, if every woman in the world had half a child less, and I'm just talking half a child, I'm not talking about like one child less, I'm talking about half a child on average, we would be at 6 billion, which I think hmm, is maybe not a bad thing to do that. So um, the, uh, the difference would be 8 billion people just by having half a child more or less. And I think that's just mind boggling. That, that's the power of exponential growth. All right, now let's go back to the Pope. And uh, um, the Vatican um, did not just say that. They also said, actually, maybe we should also, you know, raise the minimum age for marriage uh, under Catholic law from 14 to 16. I'm not sure if this happened. This was a report from five years ago. They wanted to change that. I'm not sure if they ever did that. But the uh, the Catholic law until now, I guess, says, yeah, well, you know, girls can marry um, starting at age 14. And if you think about it, that's insane. If you look at the numbers right now, we have about 640 million women who have been married as children. And that's 20% of all women alive today. I think that's another mind boggling number. So if you want to develop the world and if you want to lower the population size, the first thing we have to do, we have to educate and um, um, give women the chance and opportunity to determine their own reproduction. And part of that is that they should not get married as children, obviously. I'm not even, 
I'm not even talking about access to birth control, which is another problem. I just wanted to bring up these two numbers because I think they have a huge impact on the human population and the Catholic Church and the Muslim religion have, of course, a huge impact on these decisions. All right, let's go back to our action plan. So what can we do? We can, of course, have fewer kids. We can have smaller houses uh, using renewable energy. We can change our food consumption patterns. We can change our transportation things. You guys have all heard about these recommendations. The question is, what impact do these measures have overall? And uh, there are some studies which try to estimate the uh, actual quantitative impact of these things. And not, in, not, I mean, not surprisingly, it turns out that having only one child or one child less has by far the biggest impact on the um, environment in terms of emissions. They, they, they measure this by emission savings, okay? Um, they also claim that, you know, if you have no car, that has a big impact, of course, you know, same thing for flying. If you save one transatlantic flight a year, you would save a ton of um, um, CO2. I have to point out here, this, of course, depends on the country you live in, okay? Because some countries are more resourceful or resource intensive than other countries. So if you live in the US, you have a bigger impact if you uh, um, give up your car as opposed to someone lives in Africa or in the, in, in the UK, for example. Um, again, there's a couple of other things, you know, you can see here, of course, like uh, our food choices have an impact, but the, the interesting thing is that most other things don't have a huge impact, like, for example, recycling. They don't, I mean, they have numbers on recycling too, but I don't even say that's a huge impact, okay? It's just relatively moderate. All right, okay, so um, that's what I'm saying. I mean, people have to decide if they want to have let's say one or two kids and be prosperous, or have many kids and live in relative poverty, you know, which if you have a, if you have a farm, that may be, of course, the only option you have. But um, I mean, I think most people would probably choose a small family and uh, being fairly well off. And I think that's exactly what you see in rich countries. They just have fewer kids and choose a, a better life. All right, okay, so um, the other thing is, of course, I mentioned like the meat production industry and agriculture, which is a huge impact factor, okay, so if you could avoid that. And you don't have to become a vegan right away. I mean, if you just like cut down on meat consumption, that would have a big impact. Some, there was actually some estimates which say that if you cut your beef consumption by 50%, that would lead to 80% less deforestation globally. Uh, you can look this up, you know, so I'm not sure if that's reproducible, but it's one of these uh, conclusions people have come to. Um, and of course, you know, there's a whole range of other things you can do politically, become active, uh, vote, of course, join one of these organizations, donate money to them, uh, do stuff on social media, all of these things, you know, I mean, we can, I can talk, or we can talk about all that stuff a long time. So I just wanted to flash this up and uh, bring it up for discussion. But uh, I mean, it's actually a good point, a good question how much each of these activities would contribute to an environment. So I have one more slide be after that one. This is my second last. Uh, I just wanted to remind you of the take home messages from this presentation, like the, 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 the small amount of wildernesses and nature we have left on Earth and how much impact we have overall, which I think is scary. The impact of like even small changes in the number of kids we have. So you know, if, we, if, if we lower the average number of kids in a country by 0.1 kids, that already translates to millions or hundreds of millions of people after a couple of generations. So it, it, this has a big impact. Then of course, we have to think about this whole peak. How do we get over that peak? That will be you know, the decisive problem for the younger generation. Like if you are like 20 or 30, that's a problem you guys have to face. What do you do? How do we get over this without destroying the environment and without you know, tanking economic prosperity and all that stuff. And of course, we talk about lifestyle choices, which you guys have to think about. And lastly, I think we should we should all think about the question, what value does nature have for us? Is it really, is it an aesthetic thing? I mean, do we really need it? Of course, you know, it's beautiful. I mean, that's one good reason to like nature. You know, it's an emotional thing, but it's also, it is useful. Like if you have all the pollinators and stuff, which we need for food production, but you know, Eventually, it's literally essential for everybody in the world to live, you know, and why would we lose all the beauty in nature we have because of some uh, consumption patterns and greed in the world? And I think that would be really stupid if we did that. 
And that's the end. Thank you so much for your attention. I leave it um, to Leanne to stop some discussion here. Of course, Peter, thank you so much. So th there was a lot of information there. Hopefully um, not too I much. Well, no, no, I was I was actually intrigued when you set it up in the beginning with with all the different books and all the different same data, relatively the same data and all the different opinions. I, I realize that I'm one of the people that thinks that we have more than enough children, but I'm only saying that because I've been to a Chuck E. Cheese recently and I was I was very overwhelmed. Um, you mentioned something that I've never heard of before. That, that's not a real barometer. There's a lot I haven't heard of, but the catalog of life uh that you're that you're part of and working on it that sounds like a dating app waiting to happen if we could just get the species together that are declining and you know they take each other out for a drink you know think that well, it, it's it's one thing to collect a list of species it's another thing to uh, collect information about their populations these are all mm. really difficult problems and but again you can you all of you guys can participate in that by uh, doing citizen science project like iNaturalist collect information about species um, I would recommend that, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, my ears perked up when I heard stakes on trees. I, I would swap that out for let's just grow money on trees. My parents to say, we don't, money doesn't grow on trees. They're like, well, well, maybe it does. <laughs> maybe we have that chance now. Um, and, 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 and just a side note, I can't speak for the entire world, but we might have fewer babies here in the United States, but we still have a lot of whining. So we're not missing out on that and I, I can't cut my beef consumption. I'm so sorry because I already cut carbs. I don't want to disappear, but I'll try. I will try. So the average American eats like 200 pounds of meat a year. I think if you eat 100 pounds, that's a big step forward, you know? Okay, okay. I Well, I, I, I'll see what I can do. Maybe I'll throw okay. in French fries again, but we do have some questions and some comments here. Uh, for you uh, in the chat. Um, Daniel Graves, thank you very much. Um, wants to know what has been the main cause of the population boom to date? Is it is it uh, better medicine and healthcare? Is, is that what's going on here? No, absolutely. So it's medicine, healthcare, and of course, agriculture. We produce enough food for everybody on the planet, you know. So if you think about like 150 years ago in the 1900, 19th century, 1850, there were still famines. There are still famines relatively recently, like uh, uh, China had a famine in the 50s, I think. So, um, but now these problems are mostly gone. Okay. So we have enough food, we have healthcare, we have a better lifestyle, less uh, physical work, we have all the nutrients, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, Jen wanted to know, um, how does the annual birth rate compare to the death rate? And I'm thinking because we're living longer. It's good. Absolutely good question. Okay. So I think right now there are 130 million people uh, born every year and there are uh, 50 million people dying. So that gives us a def like a, a, oh. like a, a balance of 80 million, which the world population is growing. Um, uh, is that answering the question? Yeah, so of course, there are more so. people, there are still more people born than they are dying, obviously, otherwise the world population would not grow. Okay, so we're doing better than breaking even. Um, yeah. what, is, what is causing China and India to have, um, oh, where did it go, excess males? And will this imbalance occur in Western countries? Not uh, in the Western countries, because Western males don't cook for that, themselves. That, I'm so kidding, you guys. <laughs> well, that, that is an interesting question, obviously. But as you know, like India and China had this obsession with boys because of mm -hmm. like traditional mm -hmm. values. You need like breadwinners, you know, in your family. And so um, like 50 years ago, apparently people didn't look at women as breadwinners, you know, or as people who could make a substantial impact. It's interesting, like in countries like South Korea, that actually totally changed. They had a similar attitude like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. But that apparently changed totally. So they they, they look at uh, baby girls and boys equally, if not prefer girls in the meantime, which I think is quite astounding. I, I vaguely remember reading an article um, about that, the preference for boys and how that actually became quite damaging because the boys had then no one to marry. Absolutely. There were too few girls and they actually yeah. called the boys that couldn't be married off broken branches. Because Absolutely. that's where the family line sort of ended. It was a very short-sighted way of looking at the value of boys versus girls instead of the value of us together. Yeah. In, in China, they have, I, I think, 
a surplus of 30 million men who cannot find women or partners. And now they started uh, importing women from Vietnam and other places, you know. <laughs> that, that's so out of context. That sounds <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, but that's what I, happens, I, you know. <laughs> um, did we hear this correctly? How and why did China's population increase under the one child policy? Is that did is that correct? Is, yeah, yeah you... because it's 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 simply uh, um, a matter of uh, inertia. It takes time until that kicks in because of the age pyramid you have. So mm -hmm. you have to wait a certain time until that takes effect. You know, and as I said, that takes like about eight, 40 years because you have to wait until all the old people are dying before you really huh. get uh, you know a plateauing population uh, size. And Simon asked, did, did we hear this correctly? Is the middle class in the US really increasing? I, or is that the global middle class? Because the, the number middle class is, is. Yeah, yeah. The number I showed was for the global middle class. It's a good question how this looks in, in, in industrialized countries. It's a good question. Um, I think some people say, if I remember this correctly, and I'm not an economist, but I think that the middle class was kind of flat for most of the past few decades, and the rich got more money, they make more money and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the middle class hasn't gotten much bigger. I'm not sure, but I think it hasn't gotten really much bigger. Okay, so it's it's global versus local, and local meaning yeah. the United States. Okay, Gary, Gary Wittenberger, you were very smart, sir. You are jumping in and asking Chat GPT a question, and uh, it, he asked it: How in how many years would the population be reduced? from 8 billion to 4 billion if all couples had just one child? And the answer well, was roughly 50 years. What do you think of that prediction? So I'm not Gary, a chat GPT person. So. so Gary, did you ask chat GPT where that number is coming from? Because it cannot be true. I just say that. <laughs> so that's simply not true, okay, period. Okay. Um, Simon is asking, what about uh, climate change in um, migrations of populations as a result? How will that affect fertility? And overall births in the world. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a bipartite question. Um, so of course we have migrations of people. Um, I think you see as as soon as people migrate from poor countries which have high fertility rate to rich countries which have a low fertility rate, like the migrants adopt to the new fertility rate in that new host country within like within a generation at least. Okay, so it will change their fertility rate pretty quickly. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cecil, I might be pronouncing that incorrectly. Is J with is Japan with its declining uh, population a model to follow? Um, that is a good question. So a lot of people freak out about Japan because they have a declining population. Um, I think they should not freak out because I mean, compared to other countries, I think Japan does pretty well. It is true, of course, okay. that they have a higher demand for caretakers for all the old people. That is a certain issue. But you have to keep in mind that Japan also doesn't accept or hardly accepts any immigrants. And the same is true for uh... China. Okay? So they literally do not have immigration. And I mean, I think they have to change their stance on that. You know, uh, if they they could simply like all the northern countries which have low birth rates, they could simply, you know, replace people by having immigrants from Africa, for example, if they want to do that. Oh, that's going to change what it looks like in the nightclub for sure. Uh, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, Stephen has an interesting question. Um, does that 96 uh, percent of weight um, with humans and livestock being? Hang on. Yes, we have one more question from George here. I see you. Oh, where are you? Oh. Home. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Is there any information about shopping on Amazon versus driving to local stores? Um, he says, I don't drive or and use Amazon a lot, but I'm worried that me taking um, a bus to stores would be better for the environment. That is a good question. And I've heard about that before. I think it depends on, first of all, how you get to the store, if you go by bike or by car. If you go by car and you just go to the store to buy that one thing you would have ordered from Amazon, it's better to order from Amazon, okay? Uh, okay. But otherwise, it's easy. It's better if you go yourself on a bike. I mean, I don't have a car, so I just do everything on bike. Okay, so um, I I I actually saw that in your um. I read the article um in Free Inquiry, and you actually you 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 walk the talk. 
sir. You, you. I'm not perfect. I still fly. I have to say, I do fly. You know, occasionally, oh. uh, which is bad enough. But I don't have a car and all that stuff. I have one child. I um, I have 100% renewable energy and all that stuff. So I try my best. Okay, and I'm a vegetarian. All that blah blah blah. Uh, you can you cannot do you cannot be perfect, I guess. You know, um, you can you can do whatever you can do. You do. I, I well, I find it very impressive to to at least do something. Um, and you're doing many things, which is which is amazing. Um, but Stephen wanted to know: um, Does ninety percent that ninety six percent of weight and we would you were talking about humans and livestock include pets? And I will say, uh, just for a, a, a personal note, my cat is twenty pounds, and I am trying to work on it myself. So maybe yes, in this house. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so the number includes pets, is of course, the livestock and pets. I have to say, there, are, there is an estimated 1 billion dogs on, in the world, which is like 10 times more than there are like wolves, for example. And I do know that the, uh, the dogs in the US, for example, eat as much meat as all the people in France combined. Okay, So they do have an impact uh, environmentally. So you have to think about wow. it. Wow. Bonsoir. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a hell of a of a, of a statistic. Um, how important, uh, Polly is asking. How important is extinction of species? Because we do seem to be losing um, quite a bit. That is a really good question, and nobody really knows which is the problem. Uh, the, the the problem is, of course, if you lose species here and there, especially rare species, you would think. There's no change like uh, in the ecosystem, right? Uh, and that, that's probably true. Um, however, it's difficult to say what happens if you lose five percent or ten percent of the species, which is which is probably what will happen with increasing climate change. We know about coral reefs, which are really under big uh, extinction threats. Yeah. So if you lose like ten or twenty percent of all the species in a, in a coral reef, the whole reef may collapse. You know, and we don't know these. Um, tipping points. And that's one of the problems we uh, have to be really careful about. Um, let's dive into something. Um, I, this should not be controversial, but it is. Um, this is where we are now. Uh, David asks, how does this square with the politicians that want to eliminate abortions uh, while simultaneously reducing a woman's ability to access health care for themselves and their babies? Yeah, let's answer that five minutes before we end. Um, <laughs> What is it? I don't remember the number of abortions we have in the world. I think it's in the millions. I mean, it may have an impact, but since there are 130 million births a year in the world, I don't think it has a huge impact. It probably not doesn't have a. I think it has a huge impact, of course, on the women. You know, because we know women who are forced to have babies end up like economically in a much worse shape than uh, women who can determine their own reproductive. Uh, future, right? So, I mean, that's why I mentioned like all the the the, the girls who get married as 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 children. I mean, if if you get married as a child, you will not have the you know time and money and uh, energy to go for an education, for example. Okay, so and if if you have a teenage pregnancy, you 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 are forced uh, to have a baby. You are not allowed to have an abortion at age seventeen. You are probably done, you know. I mean, it's extremely difficult to get out of that, you know, situation. So, I mean, I'm I'm a total pro-choicer, you know. I think it's important that we have these choices. And you cannot force people to have babies. That's ridiculous. Thank you. We should put that on a T-shirt. That would be great. <laughs> um, we, are, we are getting close um, to the end of the hour. Uh, so I wanted to jump to... Um, I think this is a funny question that Curtis asked is uh, how, how many is too many people in the United States? And I'm going to say that depends on how many people are trying to get into a Costco, but that's not the answer he's looking for. Uh, another good question. Um, right now we have 340 million in the US. I mean, we are in fivefold overshoot uh, compared to other countries. I mean, the problem is, and I haven't shown that, I should have shown that. Uh, th there are uh, these studies, how much environmental impact we have like the americans have on other countries because of course mm. all of the deforestation in the amazon is because we import like whatever wood or, or or soybean or whatever from the amazon right um and so it's not just like how many people we have it's also like how people behave and i would say if everybody behaves like the average american with their consumption patterns 
probably the US should only have like, I don't know, I don't have a particular number, maybe only 100, 200 millions, you know, um, probably less, you know, or they should have to see, that's what I'm saying. I think it's easier for people to change the number of kids than to change their consumption behavior. Woo. That could be a whole other discussion right there. I, I know we're, we're right at the hour, but I want to ask one more question because Dar Darcy, I think this is a good question. How impactful was the COVID pandemic on human populations? Um, isn't the increase in population and migration increasing the risk of catastrophic pandemic? Thank uh, you for good, that question, Darcy. Good, that was great. Good question. Yeah, so um, it is true that pandemics, of course, uh, happen more easily if you have high, dense, uh, high densities in population. That's, I mean, I guess it's no surprise or, um, yeah, it's not surprising that uh, the pandemic arose in China in, in like Wuhan, I, I guess before that pandemic started, nobody knew about Wuhan, but Wuhan, I, Wuhan had like, I think it has like 9 million people or so. It's a pretty big city, you know, and things spread quickly in big cities, right? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm here in New York City. And at one point I was in the epicenter of the epicenter. So yes, I, I, I know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But we are right at eight o'clock. One more question if you want to take that. Hold on, hold on. Let me see, because I closed that window. Let me go back. Um, yes, we can get you in. Jim Taylor. Okay, I'm going to read this. Um, does high density housing make a difference in impact on environment? Um, he gives the example that in his state, Washington has government mandates for high density housing to reduce uh, land use and, and, and what that. So no, it absolutely. does have to yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, if you have a high rise, which has like uh, hundreds of people living in there, they use much less energy than um, if you have like single family homes, like in an ur urban sprawl where people drive every like miles and miles every day. I think sometimes mm. some estimates that a city saves like 15% in energy compared to like single family homes, um, just because of the density. Hmm. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Um, for your, your presentation. Uh, we, we really do appreciate your time and your expertise. And uh, we thank you in the audience uh, for um, jumping in and, and, and asking questions. And so I just wanna remind everybody, if you missed any of tonight's presentation, it has been recorded and it will be available tomorrow at skepticalinquire.org uh, for you to rewatch and to share. Uh, so again, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, for your presentation and as always my thanks to skeptical inquirer the center for inquiry and of course to all of you in the audience i'm so glad we had this time together uh my name is leanne lord thank you good night peter good night thank you so, thank much. You so much bye